long walks, by. <laughs> There's a connoisseur. It's amazing what you can get at the Finchley Labour Exchange. <laughs> It's lovely to see you, my young man. <laughs> thank you, Dave. Thank you. Well, I just want to say you're looking fit, fine, and well. And if well, you I had, I had the operation. I had it all taken away, you know. <laughs> it's all in a plastic bag in the fridge. <laughs> I'm keeping it there for the hot weather. <laughs> what would you do if you were sitting in this seat, Spike, and and you were interviewing Spike Million? What would I do? Yes. I'd say, why has it taken you 25 bloody years to ask me on the show? <laughs> I don't the think... Only, the only people he has known is Ronald Biggs and the Pope. <laughs> and that's because they sing better than him. <laughs> I don't... <laughs> Hurry up, please. The last bus goes in an hour. <laughs> sure. Where'd you get him? <laughs> we just thank you him. for that. Thank you, lone clapper. <laughs> in fact, you look, I would say, attractive. For a what man you, of seven... What are you doing later, then? <laughs> Oh, you are fitting well and obviously keeping as busy as ever. Yes, so I wear an appliance. <laughs> <laughs> it's plugged into the sound system at the moment. <laughs> so what are you up to? What are you I'm doing? up to here at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> Me? Well, not like what up to. Yes, sir. Uh, up to. Up to uh, 20 past nine at this uh... But you've got lots of bits of things in... Lots of bits, yes. They're in the fridge. <laughs> <laughs> Can I take what? you back to the goose? Well, you've got a rocket or something. <laughs> <laughs> Can I take you back? Keep going. I was just wondering what your favourite memory Well, I must tell you something. This is the first time I really met you for a That's long time. Right. And I nearly, nearly met you 35 years ago. You were appearing in the wintertime in a theatre in Halifax. And you were there the week before me, and I was there the week after. I remember, dreadful it was. I can't remember the name of the theatre. Palace. Uh, Palace. Yeah. And now, I went on the Monday night. I was first actor. I looked at the curtain, and there was about seven people in. The next night, it snowed, and the manager said, oh, this will kill the business. <laughs> <laughs> they were I, the thought, days. I thought I'd remind you that, yeah. I don't need reminding of those days, but yeah. I'm still going to take you back to the, to the goods, because... Yeah. In, I was a fan, and I, I mean, looking back, where do you get the inspiration for a voice of Eccles? Was Eccles based on a real person or something from your imagination? Or yes, you would say it was um, a Goofy in uh, Mickey Mouse. That's what the one I used to love it. I was a kid, I used to love Goofy, and that's what I did it for. Mind you, I was living in with a uh, strange company. I mean, Sellers wasn't a, was a strange guy. Mm. I'll give you an example. I used to live in a flat opposite him, and uh, Christmas week, four in the morning, a knock came on the door. So, uh, I open the door and Sellers is standing there stark naked <laughs> with a tubey hat and an umbrella. And he says to me, do you know a good tailor? <laughs> <laughs> Have you had uh, any feedback from your friend Charles about the article in the Sunday Mail? The trainee king, as you refer to him. No, he sent me a photograph of the tower. <laughs> <laughs> Cut it out, sort of thing. And free out the ticket. <laughs> Listen, I get on to Spike the author. Spike, I mean, you've got another two books out, and, and you've written, what, 43, 44? Yes, that's how many sold, really, 44 sold. <laughs> <laughs> and you've got well, these two, 40. <laughs> 44, 44. Got a room full of them. <laughs> this one's called William McGonagall Meets George Gershwin. Yes. <laughs> I mean, that's a title. I mean, a title. Who the heck is William William McGonagall? Well, William McGonagall. I mean, something you might have. Anybody heard of William McGonagall here? Yes. yes. Great, you see. And uh, <laughs> well, he, he, he basically he basically was the world's worst poet. Give me an example of his first poem. He wrote this poem. What was he? He said, "The chicken, the chicken is a noble beast. The cow is much forlorner, standing in the pouring rain with a lake in every corner." <laughs> And then there's this one, which is a novel, uh, The Loony. What's that about? It's about, uh, about 40 pages, really. <laughs> yes. With it's inflammation. A, it's Ireland, though. It's based in Ireland, isn't it? Yes, well, I, I'm Irish by descent. I, I came down in a green parish. <laughs> 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 they've done it, they've done it. They did it in under one minute, then. <laughs> right. <laughs> oh, I, I... Story of parachutes. It's a lovely Irish story about an Irish pilot flying over Dublin and his plane fails, and he jumps out, and his parachute won't open. 
As he's going down, he sees another Irishman coming up. <laughs> and he goes, Sparky says to him, do you know anything about parachutes? And this other bloke said, no. Do you know anything about gastos? <laughs> <laughs> I know you like the Irish jokes, but you have a theory that the Irish in their everyday life are funnier than the jokes. Well, I'll give you an example. My father, uh, well, his, his, his mother lived in Sligo, and uh, father used to be a, a farmer. And one morning, the wife went to wake this, uh, her husband up. She woke him up. When she went back to bring him tea, he'd gone back to sleep again. She went back and she woke him up again, and he'd had a heart attack and died. And she said, oh, Jesus, if he'd got up the first time, he'd still be alive today. <laughs> they are funny, the things they well, They have very nice people. I would drive, it, well, I would drive a, lovely, a lovely Irish story. There's Paddy and Murphy in the car. He says, Paddy, you're driving fast. He said, you think this is fast? When I'm by myself, I drive twice as fast as this. Jeez, I wouldn't want to be with you when you're by yourself. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, I'm, tr I'm trying to write a book. I mean, one would do me about 44. You probably wrote another one while you're waiting to get on, but give me any tips, Spike. I mean, you're an author of some distinction. Huh? A piece of paper's a good start. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you tackled a lot of things, like Adam Faith on earlier, a man of many facets. But have you had any, what you would call, failures that you would accept as being failures? Music, yes. I, uh... I was a jazz musician and I, I thought I was a composer. I thought, well, I'll get the, the music's making money. Forget jokes, money. And but I wrote a lot of songs, but I always just missed writing a winner. Like I wrote, uh, uh, That's Why the Lady is a Trampolinist. <laughs> uh, I, I've, uh, what's the other one? I've grown accustomed to a face flannel. Uh, the hills are alive with the sound of mucus. <laughs> Oklahoma sexual. <laughs> uh, the, uh, the, the, the phantom of the operation. <laughs> Jesus Christ, superintendent. None of them quite made it. Actually. What the other ones are? The feelings. My teeth are full of feelings. <laughs> I can see why you left that behind, but you're very serious about your music, aren't you? Because well, you've got a piece that's actually going to be performed or has yes, been well, performed. My mother is an Australian. She lives in Australia. <laughs> And uh, the, the, I, the bicentenary, I thought I'd write, my mother is a lovely piece of water called the Brisbane Waters. And I loved it out there, it's beautiful area. You've been out there many times. And uh, I thought I'd write, a, uh, uh, I'd write a grand waltz for Brisbane Waters for the bicentenary. And the Gosford Symphony Orchestra are going to perform it. How about this, December the 11th, in the uh, Sydney Opera House? Oh, that's fantastic. How about that? Well, that, that... <laughs> <laughs> now you... You yourself can currently be heard singing on the telephone. I mean, well, they, they, I can't believe this. You dial a really number. We'd like you to sing. I said, you, are you sure you're right about this? You know what I mean? Is it music for the deaf? You know? <laughs> so, do you want me to do it? In, do you want me to do it in braille? I sing it in braille. I said no. So you want to sing any song? So I wrote a little ditty. Do you want to hear it? Yes. Say yes. 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 We want to hear it, don't we? Yes. This could mean promotion for you, kid. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, let me see. It's, uh, it's actually it's a kid song I wrote for my kids. It says, Oh, there was a little fly lived in a grocery store, and he on the ceiling, and he on the floor. <laughs> he on the bacon, and he on the jam, and he on the head of the little grocer man. Oh. The little grocer man <laughs> took out his spraying gun. He said, I get that fly before the day of done. But before, before he could count up from one to ten, the little fly went <laughs> on the grocer man again. <laughs> I think you should record that and stick. That could be a hit. Now, before you go, I know you're writing all the time. What have you been writing this week? Maybe the last hour? Well, I, I am... Uh, I, uh, writing, well, I write articles for homes and gardens, things like that. But I make a practice of writing a, 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 at least a one good joke a week. You, sit, you actually sit down and write a joke? Well, sometimes when they're bad, I stand up.
And uh, I, I, I thought, you know, I always thought that sex is really pointless. Except for people doing it. If you're watching it, it's hysterical. It's <laughs> all that groaning and moaning, all that steam coming off and all this ridiculous. So I thought, really, I said, sex is heartless. You know, there's no rationale. So I'll write a joke which proves that sex is really heartless. So I wrote a joke where there's a, a man about 75, little, a little shop, and he wants a very good looking girl to go behind the counter to attract the customers. Beautiful girl turns up, and fortunately, money starts to go missing out of the till, and he catches this girl stealing money. And he said, um, I'm sorry, uh, Miss Harrison, I shall have to call the police. She said, no, don't do that. I come from a very good family, so there's no alternative, Miss Harrison. He said, that you've been telling me, I'll have to call the police. She said, no, please don't do that. I would ruin my career, my family, I'm a very good family. He said, said, there is no alternative. You can guess what. He said, uh, <coughs> said what? He said, you take me upstairs, and you can, you can make love to me. He said, uh, all right, if you put it like that, yes. <laughs> so I went upstairs, and he was 75, and he tried for about two hours. <laughs> but, but nothing happened. And he said, it's no good. I'll have to call the police. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.